Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to our investing podcast. I would also want to welcome our special guest tonight, Mr. Larry Swedrow, who has accepted my invitation to resume our previous conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Larry. My pleasure to be with you. I would like to discuss today ab about uh, different topics from investing, like, for instance, dividend investing strategies and also uh, passive income in retirement. I know that you are also an expert in managing sequence of return risk and also safe withdrawal rates of your portfolio. But to begin with, let's discuss a little bit about the dichotomy between strategic and tactical asset allocation. So, for instance, we have on one side uh, Mr. Rick Ferry, who says, stay the course, keep it simple, rebalance, be disciplined, you would be better off than 90% of people. Don't trade, don't time the market, uh, just be disciplined. On the other side, uh, we have uh, some people who advocate for tactical asset allocation. And I would like just to uh, read a small passage from um, the four Pillars of Investing, a, a book written by William Bernstein. He says the following, ideally, when prices fall dramatically, you should go even further and actually increase your percentage equity allocation, which would require buying yet more stocks. This requires nerves of steel and runs the risk that you may exhaust your cash long before the market finally touches bottom. I don't recommend this course of action to all but the hardiest and experienced of souls. If you decide to go this route, you should increase your stock allocation only by very small amounts, say by 5% after a fall of 25% in prices, so as to avoid running out of cash and risking complete demoralization in the event of a 1930s style bear market. So Mr. Larry Swedro, with your more than 20 years experience in investing, and being one of the most reputable experts in capital markets theory, I am asking you, do you think that a retail investor should ever use tactical asset allocation when investing for the very long term? Like for instance, increasing allocation to equities when valuations are lower or equities decline during a bear market? Well, uh, for, let me first say that I don't see much distance between Bill Bernstein's uh, comment and Rick's. Uh, first, Bill warns you that if you're going to do it, you better have nerves of steel. And very few people have that kind of nerves of steel that they can buy when the only light at the end of the tunnel looks like the truck coming the other way. Uh, it's much more likely that you would panic and sell than uh, be able to buy more. So, uh, and I'm sure, with, since I'm a good friend with Bill and Pen Pals, I'm sure he would also add, you should only do that if you have the ability uh, to take that risk, meaning if the left tail risk shows up and markets continue to crash, you won't be left eating cat food. Uh, so there really isn't much difference there between the two. But all Bill is saying is when equity prices crash, uh, typically valuations have come way down, which means expected returns, not guaranteed, to stocks have gone way up. And therefore, the expected risk premium is much higher. And generally, you want to buy when things are cheap. Now, the problem is just think about a Japanese investor with the Nikkei index at 40,000 in 1990, and then it drops 25% and it's at 30,000, and you up your asset allocation, put more money in equities, and then it goes to. 24,000 or 20,000 and you buy more and then it's 15,000 and you buy more and then it's 10,000 and then it goes to 8,000 before it finally bottoms. And I doubt that there was any investor who could have, uh, you know, 
kept increasing their equity allocation, let alone be hardy enough to stand the pain and be rebalancing along the way, which is hard enough for lots of people to do. So that's the first point. Uh, I'm in favor uh, because of that, of uh, you know Rick's statement. Uh, and the evidence is very clear that the people who try to tactically asset allocate, there are mutual funds, uh, hundreds of them that are tactical asset allocation funds. And the research on them is they have all dramatically underperformed, done very poorly, would have been better off just sticking with their initial allocation. There are studies on mutual uh, on pension plans that have engaged in this tactical asset allocation, and they underperform. So it's not a game that it's impossible to win, but the odds of doing so are so poor, it's simply not prudent to try. You know, you're just, you know, it's what I tell people, if you're going to sin, sin a little, which is what Bill was saying. So if you want to try to take advantage of a market crash as an opportunity, you might take a few extra dollars and up your asset allocation a little bit, but only do it if you're prepared to accept the risk that the markets will continue to crash and you don't want to panic and sell. So best advice, have a plan that anticipates the certainty, virtual certainty. We're going to have severe bear markets. We have, have uh, a, a drop of about 20% or more about once every five years. So if you're a 65, second to die, married, uh, life expectancy is 25 years, which means half of the people live longer. 25 years, a bear market every five years, you need to expect to live through five of them when your stomach is going to give you the willies and you're going to be stressed not to panic and sell, but you need to rebalance. And if you take more risks than your stomach can handle, you're much more likely to panic and sell. So make sure your plan includes the certainty almost that you're going to be tested and don't take more risks than you have the ability, willingness, or need to take. And don't tactically asset allocate. Yeah, so markets can remain irrational more than you can remain solvent. Yeah. If we refer to valuations, you have once said that any good investment can become bad because of valuations. And in 1998, you admit that you made tactical asset allocation by exiting growth stocks, which you correctly predicted that they were overvalued. And the next decade that came afterwards, the value premium was very large for value stocks. Don't you think we are in the same pattern right now? Well, let's uh, make a slight correction in your statement. Um, Alan Greenspan in December, I think it was 96, uh, right around Christmas, he called the markets irrationally exuberant. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, PEs were about 25. And we had rarely been that high. The only prior times were prior to the crashes uh, that we saw in the Great Depression, 1929, and then later in 73, 4, you know, we had a, the nifty 50 stocks had gone way up in the late 60s. So he coined it. And so if you listen to him and time the market based on valuations, you missed out on 97, 98, and 99, three more years of spectacular returns. So just because valuations are high doesn't mean markets will crash. And it does mean that the future expected returns are likely to be lower. And just as I'll point out that when the markets crash and you have low valuations, it doesn't mean they can't go a lot lower. It just means expected returns are higher, but the potential distribution is still wide. So that, for example, 
when the Cape 10 has been 25 or higher, the long-term average of earnings, the average return in real returns has been about a half a percent. That's pretty bad. That's less than the return on T-bills historically in real terms. But the best return over a decade was still over 6%, which is very close to the long-term average. Of course, the worst return was minus 6% or so for a decade. So it shows you that there is still a wide dispersion of outcomes, and that's why you shouldn't try to time it. I waited another almost two years till sometime in 98, I forgot exactly when, and the PEs kept going up. But the PEs of value stocks had remained unchanged. They were still about their historical average, but growth PEs were running through the roof. So I made the decision at that point because growth stocks were trading at PEs that gave them an expected real return that was about the same or less than treasury inflation protected securities. That to me told me there was a bubble. And I knew I could be wrong in the sense that I could be early, but I thought the odds greatly favored it. And so to so I got out of growth and when I did, I kept my equity allocation was unchanged but I became all value. Sadly I was 2 years early. So I missed two more years of strong returns for growth. But the next decade was the biggest value premium in history and I was well rewarded. Now you asked me to compare it to today. Today the Cape 10 is about 31. So that's projecting a three and a, let's call it 3.3% real return. That's really high, but T-bills are zero. So that's still a 3% or 3.3% equity risk premium. That's certainly low historically, about half of the historical annualized premium. But who's to say that's the wrong number? Uh, I don't think you should try to time stocks, and therefore I would keep my equity allocation. But in my plan, I want to make sure I'm expecting U.S. stock returns in general to be much lower than the future. So in the neighborhood of maybe 5 6%, something like that, European valuations are much lower. So their expected returns are about their historical average. Emerging markets are even cheaper, also about their historical average. So their equity risk premiums are much larger. It doesn't mean that the emerging markets are better investments because I think you're more likely to get something like 10% a year from emerging markets versus maybe five for the US. It means the market thinks emerging markets are a hell of a lot riskier and demands that premium. So uh, my advice is have a plan that diversifies across U.S. developed emerging, whatever you're comfortable with, and stay the course and just rebalance. What about a rules-based a rules based buying the deep strategy? Here in Romania, there are financial planners who say that every time the, the global market corrects with minus 5%, you should buy an additional unit of your global ETFs, let's say. Is this strategy valid? No, I would stay away from that because what you're, uh, you could be taking more risks than your stomach has the ability to absorb. I would just suggest that investors have a plan, let's say 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Then you build a rebalancing table, which I show you how to do in my books. Uh, my latest book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, has a rebalancing table in there. I recommend a 525 rule. So 5% of the absolute change or 25% of the relative change. So what that means is this, for your major asset classes like equities, 60% stocks, 25% of that would be 15%. That's too big a move to allow happen. So we use the 5% rule. 5% is 
either equities have to go below 55% before you rebalance or above 65%. You want to allow sub movement because you have trading costs and taxes. So you, those are called frictions. You want to minimize them. So, but you don't want to let your portfolio get too far away or you won't reach your plan maybe, or you'll end up taking more risk than you should. Uh, now, when you get to the individual asset classes, say, say you want to invest in emerging market small stocks, that may only be 5% of your asset allocation. You don't want to let that go up a full 5%. So that would double it. You don't want to let it to go to zero either. So I use the 25% rule. So 25% of the five would be one and a quarter. And so below 3.75 or above 6.25. Now, if you're at 60, 40, a 5% move, it takes a lot. It's not that the market moves 5%. It may have to move 20% to get there because um, of the relative nature of it. So it takes a pretty big move. And when it does, you should rebalance. And if you're unable to, that tells should tell you you lied to yourself when you to set out your asset allocation because you took more risk than you could stomach. Because as we just discussed, your plan has to include the certainty that these bear markets are going to happen and you will need to rebalance. So if you're not willing to rebalance when it happens, I would urge you then to permanently change your plan to a lower level of equity, except the fact that that costs you money. It was a mistake and you shouldn't have done it, but it's better to correct the mistake than repeat it. Because if you don't, then you, you know, it'll go down again and again, figure out what the right level is and then simply stick with that. Smart people make mistakes. What separates them from fools is they don't repeat the same ones. They may find new ones to make, uh, as I do, uh, but they don't repeat the same ones. Mr. Larry Sredrow, given the high spread between value and growth and the relative valuations across regions, what would you choose between the following practical options of investing in emerging market equities? A. An emerging markets blend fund. B. An emerging markets multifactor uh, in long only format. Or C. An emerging markets value factor. Uh, I don't think there's a right answer to that question. Uh, I think it depends on the individual. And the reason I say that is it is far more important to choose a strategy that you will stick with than to what the strategy is. You'll have much bigger dispersion and outcomes uh, if you are unable to stick with your strategy. You're almost always going to end up with the worst outcomes. So let's say, as I'll give you an example, let's say you're a value, you've read all the research, it's the early 90s. You read Fahman French's paper showing the evidence that value has outperformed over the long term. So you invest in value. And the next five years are the biggest growth premiums ever. So you wait five years and you say that's long enough. You bail out and now you switch to growth. And the next eight years are the biggest value premium ever. And then you say, you know what? Larry said smart people make mistakes. They don't repeat them. I was wrong. I didn't have the discipline. I should have waited. I'm going to switch back to value. And the next 10 years are, again, a big growth premium. And we don't know what the next period is, but I would bet heavily on value because value looks cheap. Now, so you got screwed if you were a switcher. If you stuck with either growth or value through the whole period, you were better off than if you jumped. So what I would tell people is this. The evidence is powerful. And if you're interested, read my book, Your Complete Guide to Factor-Based Investing. For premiums for size and value and momentum and profitability and quality, and they're uncorrelated or low correlated. So I'm a believer in multi-factor approaches. So the funds that I invest in 
whether it's U.S. emerging markets or developed, are value strategies that tilt towards more profitable, higher companies and more typically smaller companies as well. I think that gives you more odds of success in long term. So that would be my preference. I think you get better returns in the long term, better odds of success. Uh, and But if you're going to bail out when small and value underperform, then don't go there in the first place. Mr. Larry, we often talk about risk. Some people don't care at all about risk, while others have different understandings of risk. I, by the way, I've never met that person. Who, you know, they may say that, but I've never met a real person who doesn't care about risk. <laughs> they may lie to themselves, uh, but we eventually learn they cared. They just lie to themselves. <laughs> or they, they may not be aware of risk. So I would like to ask you, how do you reconcile the following two statements? A. If you buy value stocks, you are in a margin of safety. And this concept belongs to Benjamin Graham from the book Intelligent Investor. And the other one B, value stocks offer higher expected return, albeit higher volatility, and therefore are riskier than market beta. So actually, are value stocks safer or riskier? Well, I would say it this way. Uh... Graham was living in an era uh, where uh, companies might often trade uh, way below their book value, sometimes below their cash value. You'll never see a company trade below the cash value anymore. Uh, you know, I by the I think it was by the seventies or maybe a little later. Graham said you he basically couldn't find such stocks any longer. He was no longer a believer that he could do so. And he gave up on this idea. What really is this? Value companies are companies by definition that are trading cheap compared to some metric, whether it's earnings, whether it's dividends, whether it's cash flow, EBITDA, whatever metric you want to use. So you have to ask the question, why is it trading cheap when other stocks are trading expensive? The only logical answer is investors are not willing to pay a higher valuation on that company because they perceive there's some type of risk. Whether its management is poor, it's financially leveraged, whether it's high operating leverage, could be regulatory risk, climate change risk. Who knows what risk it might be? Uh, but the market is pretty efficient. If stocks are trading cheap, you could be virtually certain there's risk there, even if you can't see it. And that's why I believe uh, that the value premium is mostly a risk premium. Now, having said that, there is evidence uh, that the market is not perfectly efficient. There are whole groups of growth stocks or high valuation stocks that have god awful returns. These are companies that are generally characterized as small growth companies with high investment and low profitability. They're referred to as, in my terms, lottery stocks. Now, people like to play the lottery, even though the average return is minus 50% and the mean return is minus 100%, uh, or the median return is minus 100%, right? Why do they do it? They hope to hit the home run. So people think about that with stocks. Now, these lottery stocks, which also include stocks and bankruptcy and penny stocks and IPOs, they have such poor returns, these, especially the small growth stocks with high investment or profitability. Those have underperformed treasury bills, and yet people still buy them. Well, how do they trade at high valuations? Why don't sophisticated investors like hedge funds correct those mispricings? Well, there are what's called limits to arbitrage. The cost of shorting can be very high. And the risks are unlimited losses. Unlike with going long, it's easy to correct the mispricing. You just buy the stock and the most you can lose is 100%. Uh, 
If you go short, you have to pay to borrow the stock. So you pay a lending fee and these stocks can have very high lending fees. Uh, and then your losses are unlimited. You buy, you short a stock at $2 because 99% of the time it goes to zero. Your, your gain is two bucks. Your losses potentially are infinite. What if it becomes the next Amazon or Google? So these, their fear of shorting and also the charters of most institutions prevent them even from shorting. So these limits to arbitrage allow these inefficiencies to exist. So sophisticated investors can't always correct the overpricing of growth stocks. They can correct the underpricing of value stocks easily. Just buy them. So I think val the value premium is mostly a risk story. But there's also a bit of a free lunch in, in this. Uh, you know, you can outperform the market simply by avoiding these lottery stocks. So value stocks are risky, but the value premium is partly, it's not a free lunch, but maybe it's a bit of a free stop at the dessert tray. Okay. I, don't, I know that you don't recommend individual stocks, but still, if you were to, let's say, have some play money and invest in individual stocks, which rules or indicators would you use in selecting them? Like, I don't know, price to earnings, price to book value, dividend deals, debt to equity, return on equity, and so on and so forth. Well, my rule is I haven't bought an individual stock in over 20 years. I have no intention. I recommend people not do it. Uh, now, you know, if you want to have play money, it's, uh, you know, I used to go to the racetrack when I was younger. I would take 20 bucks or $18 and $2 entry fee. And I bet two bucks on each of the nine races. And if that was my entertainment, it was $20 of entertainment. I had a nice day. Uh, but I wouldn't have taken my IRA account to the racetrack. And I might go to a casino in Vegas and play blackjack at the $5 table for an hour to have fun and watch people. But I wouldn't take my IRA account there either. And I don't recommend people take their uh, IRA accounts and retirement accounts and buy individual stocks. But if you get some fun out of that, uh, you know, as long as it's money you are prepared to lose 100% of, that's okay. But I would just ask this, and I say it facetiously, if you can't enjoy your life without doing that, there's something wrong with your life, right? Uh, I get plenty of joy I need by taking nice walks with my wife playing games with my grandkids, those kinds of things. I don't need to play the stock market to have a good life, right? But if you ask me what I would do, rule number one is highly diversify because the odds of picking one, most stocks, this is what most people don't know. The average stock return has been 10%, but the average individual stock has returned far less than that. And that's because the worst you could do is minus 100%. But like you get Tesla, it might go up 700%. So the median return is well below the mean return. And the only way you can get yourself as short of the mean is to own them all. And the more you own, the better odds you have of getting close to the mean. Now, the problem for most people is the more you own, the less chance you have of hitting the home run. But this game is not about who dies with the most toys, but who avoids eating cat food, right? And uh, so you want to be near the mean, and so don't buy individual stocks. But having said that, if I had one metric and I only one, I would use EBITDA to enterprise value, which isn't always easily available. That has the best historical record of any, uh, but it's not much different then uh, earnings to cash flow, or uh, it's not that much different than PE, and it's not that much different than book value, but it's been better. Better than all of them is blending them and using a combination rule. And the reason is, if you look at every decade, you'll find, let's say we have five, you go through five decades, the odds are pretty good. It was a different metric each 
one was the best in that decade, which is telling you there is no best one. Uh, this is science from all fields of science. Multiple models are almost always better than any single one metric. Uh, this is now the science uh, that we've learned from, just like using in polling, you're much better off taking uh, the average of polls than any one poll as one thing. But science has learned this um, uh, in all fields, medicine and other fields as well. So I would use multiple metrics. And in fact, the funds I invest in all use multiple metrics. <laughs> Since you have so many years of experience in capital markets, if you were to start over again, what would you do different right now? Uh, do you regret any mistakes you did uh, as a teenager? Maybe, I don't know, not spending more money when you had more time to do it. <laughs> no, uh, I don't regret not spending more money. My All my mistakes are ones I don't make anymore. I used to buy individual stocks. I made some big bets on individual stocks. Uh, some turned out good. On average, they didn't. Uh, and I learned that trying to play that game, even though I was trained to be a security analyst, portfolio manager, I graduated at the top of my class from one of the best MBA programs in the country at NYU. And, you know, I, I learned the market is too efficient for me to try to win. And it's what you should do is focusing on managing risk and not on managing returns. Let's now discuss a little bit about dividend investing strategies, which seem to be very appealing for retail investors. And let me tell you that in 2019, the Bucharest Stock Exchange market uh, was offering the highest dividend yield in the world. We had many public monopolies, uh, and therefore retail investors are very attracted of these companies because they say they offer me passive income. So you have mentioned in a recent podcast that dividends are not income, that they are a return of capital, not a return on capital. Can you make beginners understand why dividends are not income? And after all, which is your definition for passive income? Right. So uh, income is, uh, let me say it this way. Dividends are not income except for income tax purposes, at least in the U.S., The company uh, earned income, that's its earnings per share, and it paid taxes on that already. And now it's giving you back that earnings by paying out a dividend. It's just returning the capital to you. It's not income to you. And it's simple to understand the concept this way. Let's say you gave a company, to keep it simple, $100, and that was its capital. And you you and uh, you bought one share of the stock and it traded at a hundred dollars. Now the company earns, uh, and let's say the market traded that stock at one times its book value, right? So now you bought a stock; it's one hundred dollars, and it earned ten dollars after taxes. And so now, what should the stock price be? A hundred and ten, right? Now it pays, it, let's take a company that does not pay a dividend. What's your value? It's 110. If you have income, income by definition increases your net worth, right? All right. So now you take that same company, but it's, it now pays a dividend. The stock price, it pays that income out. It pays the dividend to you with $10. And what happens to the stock price? Goes to $100 because it only has $100 of capital. So you have $100 in cash, so $100 in stock, and $10 in dividends. In the first case, you had $110 in stock. Your value is the same. So how could dividend be income when your net worth didn't go up? It actually went down if you're in the U.S. because I had to pay taxes on that dividend. So I don't want the company to pay a dividend if it's in a taxable account. 
That's bad. It would be much better if the company used that cash to buy its stock back or do nothing. And if I need the cash, all right, I could sell $10 worth of my stock. I sell it, and now I pay taxes at the much lower, in the U.S. anyway, tax on long-term capital gains instead of ordinary income. Dividends are just returning that capital to you. And the stock price will go down by the amount of the dividend, and in theory, might go down even more because the company is leverage is increased. It's more risky because it has less cash on its balance sheet. Uh, so that might be a problem too, if it does. And all a high dividend means is that the market thinks it's a very risky investment. Uh, otherwise, the dividend yield would be lower. Uh, so dividends are uh, a, a just a, let me say it this way, a high dividend yield is nothing more than a very weak value metric. Uh, in other words, it's an indicator of something selling cheap. But the research shows you get a much bigger premium if you buy stocks with low with low prices to earnings, cash flow, sales, uh, etc., rather than low prices to dividend. Mm -hmm. what the premium has been literally there's been no statistically significant premium from buying high dividend paying stocks. And I will tell you this here. If you give me one second, I'm going to I'll give you a little bit of data uh, that. Uh, OK, here we come. Um, uh, so I looked at this just the last three years uh, just to make a point, because I get this question a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, Uh, no, it's not there. Uh, at, at any rate, um, the D Vanguard High Yield Dividend Fund, which is the largest high dividend strategy in the world, so a lot of people believe in it. It has underperformed the S&P 500 for the last several years, and it's underperformed non-dividend paying stocks <laughs> by wide margins for the last several years. So... Uh, that's a real problem for investors. There's no evidence or any logic to a high dividend strategy, and it's tax inefficient. So you would have been better off to give you your own dividend by simply selling stock because dividend is a synthetic concept after all. That's right. Uh, by the way, there was a paper written back in the 1960s uh, by Medigliani and Miller and they said dividend policy is irrelevant, basically for the reason you said, you can create your own self-dividend. And that has never been refuted. And you would think with all the geniuses in finance, if something was wrong and finance professors love nothing more than to prove somebody else wrong, that's how you get published, become famous. Somebody would have figured that out in the last 60 years and no one's even questioned it. And yet you hear this nonsense from people all the time about high dividend strategies and that it's income. Uh, Statman and Sheffrin, two of the most famous behavioralists, wrote a paper explaining why people lie to themselves about this, make up stories to, you know, that help explain why they buy dividend stocks. And they're all just stories. Uh, but Dividends do not protect you from bear markets. You get that dividend and the price drops again, whether you got it there or not. The value is the same, right? It makes no difference. The company has returned capital to you, whether it's in a bull market or a bear market. doesn't matter. What about dividend growth investing strategies? There are people who would like to buy companies which grow their dividends annually. Yeah, uh, that is a better strategy, but still not a good one, because 
all you're doing is buying quality companies. Okay, so there's a quality or profitability factor there. Uh, and that's been well identified. And companies that have the same characteristics of growing earnings, have strong balance sheets, don't use a lot of leverage. They have the same returns, whether they were growing their dividends or not. And uh, what's important is today, only about a third of companies pay dividends. So you're eliminating two thirds of all the stocks, uh, which makes no sense. You're not diversified enough. Uh, so it's not a bad strategy because you're getting at this quality factor, which is played out well. But why do you want to only own one third of the stocks when you got the same returns and more efficiently? Because I'd rather own those same stocks without the dividend because I, I'm getting a higher after tax return. Yeah. So. You previously said that the more frequently we check the value of our portfolio, the worse our results are likely to be. What can we do to stop checking our portfolio so often? Uh, so that's a hard one. That's a behavioral problem. I would say uh, go have uh, t go spend time with either your grandkids or your wife. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you're tempted uh, to, to check the stock market, uh, you know, go do something else that's far more enjoyable and likely to add value and quality to life because the evidence actually shows there are studies on this. The more often you check the value of your portfolio, the worse your returns are. And the reason is quite simple. There's only two things that can come out of your checking. You'll either do nothing or do something. And if you the and the evidence shows you're better off doing nothing than doing something. Uh, most of the time you'll screw up unless you're just rebalancing. By the way, here are the returns. Uh, the S and P 500 in nine in 2018, the non-dividend payers earned 28 percent. The high dividend payers earned 1.1. 1 .1. 28 .3 versus 1.1. In 2019, the non-dividend payers earned 33.6. The high dividend payers earned 24.2. And last year, the non-dividend payers lost 2.4. And the high dividend payers um, lost 5.9. Pretty impressive. Oh, I, um, I'm sorry. I got... Uh, I, I gave you the wrong uh, years, I think. I, the numbers are right, but I, and when I was drawing up this table, I put the years wrong. So it's probably last year. Let me just check that. Yeah. So the first year I gave you with up 28.3, that was 2020. So last year, the non-dividend payers were up 28.3. The high dividend payers were up 1.1. 2019, the numbers I gave you were right. It was 33.6 for the non and 24.2 for the high. And 2018 was minus 2.4 for the non and minus 5.9 for the dividend, the high dividend. And by the way, the non-dividend payers in the S&P 500 also all three years outperformed the dividend payers. So if you focus on dividends, there's no logic to it. It makes no sense. It's not income either. And the problem is what happens is when we get these very low interest rates, people start to substitute dividend-paying stocks for safe bonds, and then the risk shows up and those dividend-paying stocks drop 30%, 40%, and now you've exceeded your risk tolerance your whole portfolio blows up and you could end up eating cat food. Uh, that's a huge mistake. Dividends are not income. They're not even cash flow or they can give you cash, but it's the same cash flow you can create with a self-dividend. Mr. Larry Sedro, should you account income risk in your own risk aversion model when you assess investment opportunities? So let me give you a simple example. Uh, one person 
has no income, only a lump sum to invest, let's say an inheritance. Another person has a single income source from his salary, so he keeps all his eggs in the same basket. And another person has several revenue streams, so being income diversified. Well, uh, I actually go through examples like that in my book, You're a Complete Guy. To, uh, or you're the only guide you'll ever need to the right financial plan. Uh, it's also covered in a bit less detail in the new retirement book. The way I explain this is you investors have two types of assets. One is your financial assets and your other is your labor capital. And if you think about a graph, uh, uh, and there's the letter L, right, is the graph, the two axes. Uh, your labor capital, uh, when you start, is at 100%. Day one, you start working because you have all of your future income. And as you go to day retire, your labor capital is zero. Your financial assets, for most people, go the other way. May even start out negative because you have student debt. And then it goes up and it peaks for many people, right? When you retire, because you may have to start to draw down uh, on your portfolio. You have to consider your labor capital when you think about your assets for the very simple reason. You have to ask yourself, am I a stock or a bond? And if you're a doctor or a tenured professor, you work for a government, the odds are pretty good your labor capital is going to be mostly uncorrelated with the economy. It's stable, like you could think of it like a bond. Your income is paying you a known amount every year with a pretty high degree of certainty. It's like an annuity or a pension, right? The closer you are to that, the more you're like a bond. Now, if you're an, a construction worker or an automobile salesman or a stockbroker, well, your labor capital is going to go up and down with the economy and the market. So your labor capital is more like equity. So if you're a bond, you can hold more stocks. And if you're a stock, you should hold less equity and more bonds because your labor capital correlates with it. So you have to ask yourself that question. Is your labor capital correlated with the economy and the market? If it is, you need to be less risky in your equity allocation. If it's not, then all else equal, you could take more risk. It doesn't mean you should. Your stomach still comes into question and play. And if you can't take a lot of risk, I don't care if you're a very stable capital, you shouldn't either. The concept of utility of wealth curve described in one of your books states that uh, greater wealth has lower marginal utility, so that the wealthier you become, the less you need to take on risk. You also say that when you have enough that you are happy, the good things in life are either free or cheap. How can you avoid being greedy since the compound interest becomes so powerful once you accumulate more wealth? Well, uh, the answer is pretty simple, as I said. There's lots of great research all around the world, uh, wherever country you go. Once you have enough income uh, or wealth uh, so that you have, uh, you, you're, you're no longer concerned about putting food on the table, a roof over your head, uh, your kids can have a decent education, those kinds of things, then you're no happier than people who have 10 or you're no less happy than people who have five times, 10 times, 20 times as much money as you have. In the United States, the average income where people are no more or less happy is only $75,000. Now, if you live in a small town in Arkansas, it's probably 50000 if you live in New York City, it might have to be 150,000, but the average is 75,000. What matters and makes people happy once you achieve that standard, okay, are only two things. One, the depth and breadth of your social relationship. So I like the phrase, how many three o'clock in the morning friends do you have? 
In other words, if there's an emergency, who can I call at three in the morning and they'll come without thinking about it? And if you can't name of you know a lot of people, then there's something you need to focus on that. And the other is you have a reason to get up in the morning, uh, which is something that fulfills you both emotionally, intellectually, you feel uh, challenged, successful, etc. Uh, and none of those have anything to do with wealth or income. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people who are wealthy, retired, and became candy stripers at hospitals, doing charity work. That's how they keep the depth and breadth of social relationships. Uh, they go to classes and universities and stay intellectually challenged. They don't retire from life. So the most important thing is, once you achieve that wealth, you should lower your equity exposure so you don't have to worry about the market and then go enjoy your life because you have to understand more wealth likely won't make you that much happier. And in fact, for many people, it makes them miserable. There's a wonderful book called Strangers in Paradise I'd recommend reading. A lot of people, let's say you grow up like me, I was lower middle class, you, you, through your efforts, success, education, Maybe you build a business, sell it, you become wealthy. And what, what do people then do? They move out of their house where all their friends are in that neighborhood. They buy this mansion, move into area. Now none of their friends want to come see them because they're not comfortable around that wealth, can't compete and keep up, lose their friends and everything else, and they're miserable. Uh, it's a real, so what the most important thing is understanding what makes people happy. And no one really uh, should want to die with on their tombstone or reading, I died with the most toys, but I was a good father, I was a good husband, I was a good friend. And you, that has nothing to do with wealth, right? It's about being there for your family, spending the time with them and not worrying about where markets are going and all the rest of this stuff. So uh, you like golf, you can go play at the local municipal golf course for 20 bucks or something. And you get the same walk in the same sunshine as paying a thousand dollars to play at Pebble Beach. Now, is it nicer at Pebble Beach? Yeah. Would I enjoy that more? Yeah. But does it change anything in terms of what's meaningful in your life? The answer has to be no. Right. Especially if you did it once already, right? Okay, that was great. I played it once. The second time, it's not as good, right? Anyway, so that's the lesson. I'm going to have to run. Uh, hopefully, this was helpful uh, and, and your uh, listeners enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Mr. Lady uh, Swedro. It was a great pleasure for me and also an honor, an honor to discuss with you today. I hope many members of our Romanian investing community will appreciate your ideas which you have shared with us today. Now, famous last words are yours, Larry Svedro. Yeah, I would say this. Uh, take the time to educate yourself uh, about investing because sadly, our uh, educational institutions don't do it. I've written 18 books. Uh, you don't have to read them all. Uh, even just reading my retirement book uh, uh, would be a great start. Uh, there are other great authors, Bill Bernstein, Rick Ferry, John Bogle, all are, are excellent reads. You don't have to read all that money. All of us are basically telling the same story here. Just read the right books, not how to get rich quick or how to pick stocks. That's all the wrong strategy. And then focus the rest of your time on what are the really important issues, the big rocks in your life. I'll end with this story. Joseph Heller is a, Nobel, uh, is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author. Uh, he won a prize for his book, uh, Catch-22. Uh, and he was with uh, another friend of his uh, who wrote, uh, oh, I can't remember the author's name. Um, um, but anyway, this other friend uh, got invited him out uh, to uh, 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 this investment banker's house for a party at McMansion you know, 20,000 square foot house on Long Island. Uh, and uh, 
he get there and he says to him, Joe, doesn't this piss you off? This guy, you know, makes more money in a day than all the royalties you'll get from an award winning book. And Heller says, no, it doesn't bother me at all because I have something he'll never have. And the friend said, what could that be? He said, the knowledge I have enough. And with that, take care. Thank you very much, Mr. Larry Swedro. I wish you all the best and stay healthy. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.